Okay, everybody hear me okay? So what I'd like to do a little bit is in, in my presentation is to talk about the impact that risk assessment has had in, um, in the way we, we look at standards, the way we look at uh, different levels of control, et cetera, and why it's been a, a great boon and a great bane at the same time because it, it's uh, allow, allowed us to take a much more objective look at some of the factors we're dealing with. So what I'd like to do in my presentation is cover the, the, the following five uh, areas, uh, give you a little historical perspective, uh, then I want to focus a little bit on the uh, dose-response relationships and how they uh, very much affect how we, we look at the, the risk associated with foodborne disease, a little bit about estimating exposures, then I want to talk about something that comes directly out of some of the recent experiences and talking about the importance of distributions. And then finally, I have a couple of concluding remarks I want to make. So to put this in a historical perspective, uh, in 1995, FAO and WHO did a, an expert consultation bringing in scientists from around the world to talk about the application of risk analysis to food standards. And they went on and talked a, a, a lot about how to use it in terms of chemical hazards. But they got to microbiology and basically they said that the uh, risk assessment techniques for uh, microbiological food hazards uh, was not likely to be available in the near term. Um, and this was in large part because of the complexity of microbial relations in food. So this is a good example, and I, I might note, I know there are people out here that actually attended that, that meeting. Um, so um, it's, the, it's not ancient history. So this was how things changed very rapidly. Uh, so by 1998, we started to see the first of the uh, formal risk assessments being done in microbiological issues by government agencies, by FAO and WHO, et cetera. And so in a very short amount of time, we went from it being impossible to it being a reality. And since that time, um, we've also had a push to expand these kinds of activities because of the World Trade Organization and the passing of the SBS agreements and the TBT agreements which basically say that if you're going to have any kind of, of challenge to uh, requirements, you're gonna to have to do a risk assessment, particularly when you get into areas such as equivalence in establishing microbiological criteria. And this was further stimulated by Codex Alimentarius being identified as the standard setting body uh, internationally and by its acceptance of a risk analysis framework. So, since that time, since the, the last 15 years or so, what we've seen is a whole series of microbial risk assessments being done. These have been sponsored by national governments, by um, FAO and WHO, and now they're down to being routinely done by academic institutions as part of the training for um, their graduate students particularly. So if you were, went back 10 years, you could probably get a PhD for doing a, a good microbiological risk assessment. Now you might be able to get a master's degree. So it's become you know, fairly routine and a lot of techniques have been developed. But this is a list of just some of the organisms that have been looked at formally through different types of uh, microbial risk assessments. And I might note this encompasses a, a vast array of different foods. So, the emergence of, of QMRA uh, has moved the management of food safety in a direction from largely a qualitative approach to a much more quantitative approach. We've seen a much more quantitative approach to considering dose-response relationships. We've seen drastic improvements on how we conduct exposure assessments. We routinely used uh, fairly sophisticated scenario analyses to look at the relative effectiveness of different preventions and intervention strategies. We now increasingly go through a process of formal uncertainty determination. 
Um, and then finally, we use sensitivity analyses uh, with increasing sophistication to look at the relative importance of different risk factors. So I'd like to start exploring these, some of these in more detail and talk a little bit about the, um, the impact. And so in this section, I'm going to be talking about microbial dose-response relationships. Or my subtitle here is Ending the Search for Minimum Infectious Doses. And there was, from history, when I learned uh, my initial clinical microbiology training, everyone talked about a minimum infectious dose. And there's been a lot of work trying to find out what this minimum infectious dose is. Well, basically, at somewhere in around 2000, we gave up because it's a myth. So a little bit about to zero tolerance and what you need to do to keep in perspective. And so a little history on zero tolerance. Zero tolerance was actually first used in the media, in the literature, to express a high degree of concern about um, illicit drugs and that we had a zero tolerance, for example, of anyone selling drugs around a school. That's where it came from originally. It has morphed into a general statement where someone is trying to express an attitude or a level of concern about the importance of some, something that is affecting public health. So, the concept of zero tolerance really started to take hold in uh, food safety microbiology when we realized that we had this inherent inability to establish thresholds for infectious and toxico-infectious organisms. Instead, we realized that in, in terms of disease processes, it's a probabilistic nature, and two, you always have to take into account that these organisms are, you know, living entities and they have a, a, a ability to have independent action. So basically, when we started to evaluate these in terms of what kinds of dose-response relations we were doing, uh, we broke the organisms into two categories. Uh, on the left-hand side, what you see are the toxigenic microorganisms. These are things like Clostridium botulinum or Staphylococcus aureus, where you're getting a preformed chemical in the food. And basically, these fit the more, more traditional threshold-based models for dose-response relations. One that falls into this category that it doesn't work, that is for the, the mycotoxins, particularly if they're carcinogenic or mutagenic, this gets you over to non-threshold models because of the way that we, we view the probabilistic nature of mutations and chemical uh, um, production of car uh, cancers. Now, what's interesting here is as we moved into the microbiological range, and nobody wanted to sort of talk about it in, 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 in the public, is the best models that fit infectious agents or toxico-infectious agents are non-threshold models. And Don introduced them a little bit, and it's now generally accepted that when you're dealing with dose-response relationships with, with foodborne pathogens, you're going to be dealing with a non-threshold model which has the following implications. That a single cell has a definable probability of producing an infection. That the probability increases with the number of cells that are ingested. And then the appropriate models to use with these agents are non-threshold models that have a linear or log linear extrapolation at low dose regions. So, look, having you look up at these two graphs up here, I'd, I'd ask you to, to think about which one is an example of a non-threshold model. And so, how many think the, the one on the, the right is a non-threshold model? Just put your hands up. Okay. How many think that the one on the left is an example of a threshold model? Well, and I see we're getting a lot of participation here. <laughs> so the, the probability is that you're, you're the, the baseline is they're both non-threshold models. 
that one of the things that's wrong with the way we do dose response models is we do it in a way that you can't tell the difference on the math, from the math. So the one on the right is the way it probably we increasingly are looking at non-threshold models to be able to look at that low dose extrapolation. We also have a problem when we're dealing with, with dose response relations with humans that we have a huge amount of variability that the population we're dealing with goes from people that are exquisitely sensitive, people that have various states of immune being immune compromised, up to people that are totally resistant because they have built up immunity to the organism in question. Now, one way of getting around this is that you, you quit looking at the entire population. And in fact, we've increasingly done this in managing food safety risk over the last 10 years, where you develop dose response models for individual populations. So to give you an example, this was some work that came out of one of the risk assessments done by FAO and WHO, uh, where they looked at the attack rates associated with different people having different diseases. And so what you have here is a whole set of different dose response curves that have been generated for people or subpopulations that have either are, nor, you know, have no underlying conditions or that have various underlying conditions. So what you see here, if you go from the most sensitive population that was covered in this study, which were transplant patients, they are about four orders of magnitude more sensitive to, in this case, I think it was, list yeah, it was Listeria monocytogenes compared to someone that is under the age of 60 and healthy. Um, as someone that is now in, in to their um, above 60, I'm, I'm a little bit higher up in that range. And you're there too, Don. <laughs> okay, so what are some of the implications of what we're seeing in terms of dose response? Uh, relations as a result of the work in risk assessments. One, the, the whole concept of minimum infectious dose is out the window for an infectious or toxico-infectious agent. And anybody that says they're looking for that minimum infectious dose, you need to send them back to school. Second whiz is you get, start to get into increasingly exquisite sensitivities in certain subpopulations. You ought to be considering the strategy, alternate strategies on how to manage that, those people. In fact, if you look at just the, whoops, what's this doing? The other thing that it's increasingly becoming evident as we start to look at these things is the criticality of informed decisions by consumers about their own personal susceptibility and there needs to be a more outreach from the, the medical community to actually have talks. Now, this has been very successful for certain subpopulations. If you're a pregnant woman, you're almost assured to get a lecture or at least pamphlets about listeria risk associated with your pregnancy. And that has had a, a very strong and dramatic effect on reducing the number of cases of, of uh, pregnancy-related uh, listeria cases. It's also given us a real good feel for the relative infectivity of different organisms. So if you want something that's highly in infective, um, noroviruses, salmonella, their orders of magnitude difference in terms of their capability of causing disease as compared to something like uh, Listeria monocytogenes. A little bit about um, exposure assessments and how this has changed our view as we've gone through. And the, the subtitle here is, what did the consumer actually eat? And so a lot of the data for QMRAs in terms of the number of pathogenic organisms is a critical thing, because it's only what goes in your mouth that counts in terms of the dose response relationship. However, almost all of our data is not collected as you start to eat your food. Most of the data is either collected at the end of manufacture or at some point during the retail marketing. So in order to, to do a 
exposure assessment, you have to find a way of predicting what goes into the consumer's mouth. Um, these are, these kinds of changes can be tremendous in terms of size. A little bit of a temperature abuse, it grows. Cooking, it dro they drop, etc. You also have to also consider estimating these in, in terms of the actual condition of the organism. Classic example is Vibrio. Vibrios are usually very sensitive to the acid in the stomach. Because of that, they have a relatively high um, dose, uh, re dose response relationship. You pre-adapt them to an acid environment and the sensitivity, your susceptibility drops about three orders of magnitude. Okay, so predicting what goes into the uh, consumer's mouth is in microbial risk assessments is primarily done through predictive mo microbiology modeling. And in fact, if there hadn't been 10 years of investment internationally in predictive microbiology, you would have not been able to do a microbial risk assessment of the type we now do. And that's not surprising that a lot of the predictive microbiologists um, that were around at that time were some of the first people to do microbial risk assessments. Right now, however, our big limiting factor is what we refer to as consumer phase models. The consumer behaviors are highly variable. We have little data that's been generated, and so this one is an area ripe for uh, improvement and would certainly enhance our ability to make informed decisions and for the consumer to make informed decisions. Now, this has allowed us to do some things we've never done. This is a graph straight out of the, the 2003 FDA FSIS risk assessment for listeria. For the first time, that allowed us to do some quantitative risk ranking. And for those of you that are not familiar with this graph, this is 23 different categories of ready-to-eat foods, estimating their relative risk. And it gave us also some real insight into things like the ones in blue are foods that support growth of listeria. The ones in the middle in black are the ones that sometimes support growth of listeria. And the ones on the far right are the ones that don't support the growth of listeria typically. And I might note ice cream is down there and I'll talk about that a little later. And that generated a whole lot of charts and it set up it was used to set up priorities. So this was the, um, the relative ranking that we gave out of this 2003. I might note this is probably is not the ranking anymore. A lot of the stuff that was in the high risk areas have been modified. The industry has done a great job of responding. So the first thing to do to make sure that a, a risk ranking is not accurate anymore is to publish it and they immediately start changing it. Okay, the last area I want to introduce is, is one that has become of interest only in the last few years. And this is the importance of understanding distributions within your, your processing. And this, in my mind, came, in, in terms of me thinking about this, came out of the, the Bluebell outbreak, which turned out to be sort of a, a, a perfect storm. And what you had in this situation was a listeria monocyte monocytogenes outbreak involving a brand of ice cream. Ice cream is supposed to be a, a non-risky product because it, um, has, it won't support the growth. I might note this changed a little bit because the actual product were milkshakes made from the ice cream. And then on subsequent investigations that Don had a lot of, a lot of big part in getting the data that we actually can look at is the ice cream was found to have a high frequency of low level contamination, typically in the range of one to 10 CFUs per gram. Um, and what this has done is reinforced the interpretation of systems failures. So let's talk a little bit about microbiological standards, criteria, et cetera, and risk. When you're considering how stringent you need your food safety system to be, you have to deal with two different types of risk. The first one, and the one probably most important, is the risk of non-compliance. 
This is the risk that a proposed standard is not going to be met. And this can be broken into two different types. The risk that contamination exceeds the standard. You overcome your, you have a, a level higher than your system can handle. Or the risk that the pathogen is, pathogen is introduced after manufacturing. The second risk is the residual risk. This is the risk that's left over when you establish a, a level of stringency and that system is working as it intended. Now, the residual risk is going to vary greatly with different organisms and it's going to vary differently with different foods. And so, uh, and in fact, I would look at the, assuming that of all the data that Don presented on different types of products, if they were all manufactured under good practices, uh, that is, they were, didn't have, they weren't violating a compliance type of thing, that would be a measure of the residual risk. So, another important concept here is in a zero tolerance world, it assumes that any positive test result is a non-compliance, is a sign of non-compliance. Despite the fact that you can easily predict, based on the standard you set, that you will occasionally get positive samples. And that's why the product is, is being made under good practices. Now, the Blue Well episode then establishes, a, to, in my mind, a third type of risk. So you have the first one, a compliance risk. This is a reliability error. And this is likely going to be associated with outbreaks. You have a residual risk. This is the error when the system is working under control. It is likely to going to contribute, at least theoretically, to sporadic cases. And if you have a resident organism that is going to be picked up by whole gene sequencing, it would be also classified, it could be alternatively classified as an outbreak. And then finally, you have a systemic GHP risk. And again, this is a reliability error, and it's likely going to be associated with an outbreak. And what is important about the systemic GHP risk is that a distribution counts. So to do this, I'm going to use a, a very simple example, and uh, you need to con that you need to consider all types of risk. And so I'm going to set up an example here of Listeria monocytogenes, and I'm going to do three different scenarios. And this is based on a very simplistic type of, um, of analysis. It's a stochastic model that I developed, and it's, it's very simplified, um, but it, it's, it's pretty good. So in the first case, I'm going to look at a, a, a gross contamination event where you have listeria at 10 to the 5th CFUs per gram in about 10% of servings. The second example I'm going to use is where you have 10 CFUs per gram in 1% of the servings. And I might note this is a diverse genotype if you want to get into root causes. And then the third one is going to be a 50 CFUs per gram in 90% of the servings. And I'm going to, I, when I ran through the math on this, I assumed that the servings were 100 grams. There were a total a number of servings of 100 million being produced, which is not out, that's actually in the ballpark for a lot of products uh, in terms of what goes out on the marketplace. And that I, to sort of exaggerate this, this was all going to be consumed by high risk patients. So graphically, this is what I'm looking at in this example. You have example one is the classic type of distribution you would see with an outbreak, a major outbreak. Number two is sort of the operating under good hygienic practices. This is where you were, you're largely dealing with residual risk. And you're seeing a fairly wide distribution with the mean being far away from what would be normally the, the cutoff point where you're trying to, to work at. The third example is one where you have a, again, you have a high frequency of low level contamination. And in fact, you have a very small standard deviation in this example, and it butts up right to the, the, the level. 
Now, one thing I do want you to, to look at there is that for example two and example three, they both at the 95% area cut off. But to any risk assessor that would look at these two would say, the, which, of the, which is more risky, number two or number three? Number three is substantially more risky. So when I went through and all, did all of this and I used a, a, plugged it into the FAO WHO risk assessment, their, their susceptible individuals uh, dose response curve. So for scenario one, the classic outbreak, I get sort of the classic numbers you would see in an outbreak, about almost 600 predicted cases. For scenario two, this is the one that would be very similar to operating under a good GHP situation. I get 0 0.006 cases per 100 million servings. On the other hand, when I take that distribution and I move it right up to the edge there and move it up, I predict about 2.6 cases with this model, which I might notice get, gets you in the same sort of order of magnitude as you saw in the, the Bluebell type of a situation. And that's what this was, was in, intended to do. So what this implies is that the standard, you have to not only um, have an upper limit, but you have to consider the distribution in order to take into account systemic GHP errors. Now, what it also implies to me is that if you're going to do microbiological testing and you need to in, uh, evaluate it in terms of not only its upper limit, but also its distribution, then you're going to have to get away from two class sampling plans and you're going to have to move to three class sampling plans, which nobody wants to do, but it's the way that you're going to be able to come up with a, sense, a, a sampling plan that has the appropriate distribution. So this is just a quick example I did uh, in terms of switching from a two-class plan where you would only have a big M to a three-class plan where you would also impose a certain def uh, distribution. And you can see that it, it doesn't take you long to actually develop, uh, once you have the parameters you want, to develop a, an appropriate method. Okay, and why so much focus on an appropriate method? Well, I want to reinforce what Don had to say. Okay, in order to verify that you're me meeting a zero tolerance, you have to operationalize it by actually developing a sampling plan and a testing protocol to verify your compliance. As soon as you do that, you establish a non-zero value. What you're looking at is your ability to detect not the, the specific risk that's associated. And so what you have here is effectively a non-transparent risk management decision that establishes a non-zero tolerance. And so Don and I are in absolute agreement on that one. Okay, so a couple con conclude, concluding remarks. Quantitative microbiological risk assessment is forced us to, to take a different look as we're dealing with food safety risk. It's forcing a more objective consideration of the science underlying managing the risk. It's helping us identify where along the chain are the greatest vulnerabilities and likewise the greatest opportunities for control. It's proving a tool that is, allows us to more effectively design and implement food safety programs. And it's forcing food safety managers now to be able to to manage hard decisions because there is no minimum infectious dose. It's a non-threshold model. So this emer emerging scientific consensus of non-threshold models is requiring a reevaluation of management approaches that were traditionally based on minimum infectious dose concepts. And what that also means is that what we need to do in microbiology and, and food safety policy is to go back and see what the lessons have been learned with other types of hazards, particularly chemical hazards, where you have to deal with a non-threshold model. Where, how do you use a non-threshold model? How do you develop programs that manage risk, design control strategies, and set standards that establish performance metrics? And how do you communicate that to the public? And we do it all the time. All of our pesticide regulations, all our food additive regulations, et cetera, are all built around, if they're carcinogenic, 
are built around the concept of non-threshold models. And I think that's it, and I'd like to thank you, and if there's time, I'll answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan. We have time for just a couple of questions. Oh, Dane will take up all your time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope not, but Bob, thanks again for a, a, a great presentation. It is, as always, deep and, and uh, very thoughtful. It's nice, first of all, to see the concept of residual risk, which has finally made its way into the lexicon. It's an important concept and tool, and I'm glad to see that it's now kind of on the board. Um, I may have misinterpreted your comment, and if, if so, I apologize. But it seemed like you were saying that standards should be set in recognition that there will be some nonconformance which results in a greater rate of contamination than may be expected. Okay, um, so let me, let me try to ex make well, sure that I understand you. Go ahead. Well, it was, it was kind of, it's like the third slide from the end. There was a bullet there that said standards uh, should be set in recognition. I think, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but this may be one that we want to have a conversation over a beer <laughs> and try to, try to get into that. But I wanted to understand if that was, was your intent, because if it is, I would disagree, because then you get into uh, taking nonconformance actions and regulatory actions against companies that may have proper GMPs and following those good hygiene practices and performing correctly. So if, if the standard in, is set for the worst performer, then those who are adequate would be caught in the same net and you'd have to adjudicate that somehow. The other comment I wanted to make is you had a, a very nice slide with the risk factors, including frozen, kind of lined up. I wonder how that chart would look if you considered that concept of uh, residual risk being out of control by nonconformance to expected performance standards seems to be a factor that should be thrown in because the graph, the chart would look quite different. Everybody would kind of flatten out because you're, the assumption is that if you're in control, your normal contamination level allows those other factors to come into play, whereas if you're not in control, all that kind of goes out the window. So again, thanks for, for a very thought-stimulating uh, discussion today. Thanks. Okay, and, and help explain that a little bit more for you, Dane. The residual risk, when you establish the standard, that's what you're establishing, is the residual risk that you now have designed your policy for. Most problems are associated with not meeting those standards. The exception for this is that if the residual risk has been established based on the assumption of a certain distribution within the product that's coming out, and you move it all the way up to the edge, then that distribution, then you have to change what you're doing. So you need to also take care of the limit and also the distribution under that limit to get what you need. Okay? But it, it's, it's really important to separate those different types of risk out because the way of managing them are very much different. If you, if you don't like your residual risk, you drop the standard to a lower level. But if the problem is compliance, that's not going to help at all. You're, in fact, you're going to get more risk of noncompliance. Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to go sit down. Thank you very much.